federal court has ruled against the Biden administration for pressuring social media companies to censor speech about COVID policies. Now, the case is Missouri versus Biden. It pits the attorneys general of Missouri and Louisiana, civil liberties groups, and several censored social media accounts against the White House, the CDC, and other government agencies. Judge Terry Doughty issued a preliminary injunction in July barring the Biden administration's communication with Twitter, Facebook, etc. As of Friday, the Fifth Court of Appeals upheld these restrictions that were imposed by the judge. A move Louisiana Attorney General Jeff Landry has hailed. Here he is speaking outside the court. What I'm going to what I continue to say is the the most important First Amendment case, uh, certainly in modern times. Uh, I think that this is a case that ultimately will end up at the Supreme Court and really determines, uh, you know, the scope anymore of the First Amendment in a virtual world. Here to discuss this case further is Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, co-founder of Illusion of Consensus Substack and professor at the Stanford School of Medicine. Welcome, doctor. It's an honor to have you. My honor as well. Thank you for having me. So your account, obviously, I think this is probably well known to viewers, but just in case it's not, was one of the accounts that uh, was um, censored, moderated, um, and now we're, we've learned subsequently about all the gu you know, guidance <laughs> given by the government to the social media companies to take this action. Why don't you start by um, you know, filling in our viewers um, exactly which, what sentiments you were expressing that, um, that got you axed from, uh, from the platforms? So I, when I joined Twitter in, in August 2021, uh, I was immediately put, it, it turns out, on a trends blacklist. I found out from reporting from the free press that Barry Weiss did. I actually got invited to Twitter. I could see in the Twitter database, my face next to it said trends blacklist. I put on a blacklist, um, essentially reducing the scope uh, of a set of people that could, could see my post. I was advocating for the Great Barrington Declaration, which is a, a policy proposal I wrote with Sunetra Gupta of Oxford and Martin Kuldorf of Harvard in October 2020, arguing for focused protection of better pro protection of vulnerable older people um, and lifting of lockdowns. Uh, it, it, earlier in the pandemic, I'd also been censored from YouTube for a video where I was speaking with the gov uh, sitting governor of Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis, advising him about uh, the the uh, evidence on whether masking children had any effect on the pandemic. I told him correctly, based on the literature, that there is no randomized evidence suggesting any efficacy of masking children. And YouTube took down that video. From the Missouri versus Biden case, what we've learned is that these were not accidents. What happened actually was that the government was pressuring social media companies on uh, uh, setting an agenda for them for who and what to censor. It, it, it didn't matter if what they were sent what they were censoring was true or false. They just was inconvenient to the government preferred policies on COVID, uh, and so I was I was sort of at the at the crosshairs of that. But it wasn't just me, Arabi. It was it was a tremendous number of Americans who, uh, whether they again based on true or false statements, it was legally protected speech. They posted it on social media. The government pressured social media to, to label it as misinformation or to take it down or suppress its reach even without the people knowing it. It was a direct violation of the American First Amendment as the Fifth Circuit just uh, just confirmed. Are you confident that this ruling, assuming it's upheld, uh, will get to the root of this problem that as long as the government is barred from explicitly reaching out to social media companies and applying the pressure as they've done in the past, that it will end the practice of the kinds of blacklists that you were put on? Are you, are you concerned that this isn't the end of what has become a theme, where there is both soft and hard pressure at some of these organizations to exert, whether it's their political uh, sentiments or restrictions on some other kind of basis that have attacked any number of communities over the years? I uh, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think it's a fantastic first step. I can't. I mean, I have to say, I was overjoyed to see the ruling because it essentially tells the government that they're not allowed to talk to social media and coerce them. I mean, they were essentially saying to the social media companies, "Boy, that's a nice company you got there. It'd be shame if something were to happen to it." I mean, in effect, uh, and and uh, social media companies complied. I will say there are some restrictions in this ruling relative to what the district court ruled that I find a little bit troubling. So, for instance, um, this court said that the government can continue to work with academic outsiders to set a hit list for what should be censored. Uh, 
Uh, so they can, for instance, there's a there's a, a group here on cam- on my campus at Stanford called the Stanford Internet Observatory that works with a government agency called CISA that uh, that, that, that that or or or, or at least is, advises their work output is uh, informs CISA that that uh, and what they do is they analyze the internet looking for things that they think is misinformation, and a lot of the the sort of agenda setting for which accounts to take down, uh, which which people to go after. Uh, is set by outside organizations with the government cooperating with outside organizations. Um, and I think that that ought to be something government ought not do. And this ruling allows that to continue to happen. Uh, now, the government can't now, under this ruling, use those that information and then threaten social media companies, uh, which is good. But I, I would like to see more. You bring up the the Stanford Internet uh, Observatory, which uh, you're right has uh, we've been able to exhaustively chronicle um, all of it, its efforts to exhaustively chronicle what it describes as misinformation on a on a host of topics, um, not just COVID, but also um, uh, you know uh, for supposedly Russian based misinformation on the platform, national security threats, um, all, all of that stuff. I I, I got to ask since you're you're at Stanford, are there like uncomfortable you know faculty lounge discussions about like Hey, why are you trying to get me, um, you know, banned from the internet? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, Stanford's, uh, uh, I guess, fortunately, unfortunately, a big place. I have not run across the the professors that are directly involved with the Internet Observatory. I have to say that I mean, I find it incredibly troubling to be at a university that essentially participated in the agenda setting for this Ministry of Truth. Um, and I don't understand why a professor or or a, a or, or student that would use their their intelligence and energy for that purpose when they could be using it for for uh, you know sort of things that actually do social good and I and I you know I don't know but I'm not I'm not their boss and mm-hmm. they have academic freedom uh, I, I mean I think they can go and do whatever they like uh, but the question to me is should the government be sponsoring it should the government be participating in this kind of agenda setting for uh, for suppression of speech and I think that's my problem. Like the, the you know professors can do whatever whatever they. I mean I'm not I'm not I, sure. I believe very strongly in academic freedom. Uh, I wish they do something different, but that's another that's another that's another question. So Judge Dowdy, you know, drew some some distinctions that you know X Y Z is allowed, um, A B C is not allowed, and then this this newer ruling drew some slightly different uh, distinctions. You know we await perhaps eventually um, clearer and ultimate guidance from the Supreme Court. Although, you know, I, I think, you know, even you, you and I who probably agree on 99 percent of this stuff about the influence being bad, you know, there is there's probably most people would think some amount, you know, the government, the FBI telling social media companies, hey, this is a, ISIS is organizing on the platform or there's child porn here or something. There will be uncontroversial moderation, you know, and where the uncontroversial stuff stop ends and the and the you know the legitimate speech that they shouldn't be providing input on in begins it's clear in a lot of cases but it's not always ultimately going to be clear and is that something that judges rather than some kind of legislature is ultimately going to be able to draw a line that is satisfactory uh, and another great question I mean I think uh, I completely am in favor of res- content moderation to you know suppress child porn I think uh, your criminal activities, on on the web, I mean, absolutely should be suppressed, and I think the government has a legitimate interest in making sure that there aren't, uh, you know, social media companies that are that are uh, allowing that to occur or or aiding it on their platforms. That's not legally protected speech. Uh, I think you know, and legislatures have already weighed in on what is this distinction between legally protected and not legally protected speech, as have courts. Um, there's a long uh, sort of law, uh, history of the law, or, or uh, it, that describes those that kind of distinction, and I am completely in favor of it. I, I'm, I'm not arguing that we should allow, uh, a, you know, a criminal conspiracies to happen on on Twitter. That doesn't make any sense. It's in Twitter's interest even to like suppress that. What I'm saying is that there should be le- that the government has no interest in suppressing legally protected speech, even in the name of suppressing misinformation, because the government doesn't know what misinformation is when it comes to this kind of legal respect of speech. They were wrong on so many issues, issue after issue after issue on the COVID pandemic, on issues like wh- how harmful a school closure is going to be, how effective were they going to be in actually protecting kids uh, and, 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 and adults from COVID, uh, on natural immunity after COVID recovery, on uh, the efficacy of the vaccines to stop you from getting COVID, on issue after issue after issue, the government was wrong. And they suppressed legal speech pointing out that they were wrong. 
that that's just entirely inconsistent with the American First Amendment. And it's also bad public health. You mentioned earlier that you discovered you were on a blacklist in part because of Bar Barry Weiss and her relationship with the Twitter files and the access that the Twitter files gave the public to what had really been going on within the company. Obviously, there was a very public split between Barry Weiss and Elon Musk uh, after she objected to what she felt was some hypocrisy on his end with respect to how he was managing speech on the platform. And so I, I wonder if you have had any follow-up, any in uh, further insight into whether or not you were removed from the blacklist, whether similar kind of blacklist persists, perhaps targeting other kinds of individuals, and what your feelings are about how much transparency there should be uh, from organizations like Twitter. Obviously, this is outside of the government's purview. This isn't a direct free speech issue. But given the influence of these platforms, what would you hope to see from Elon Musk or any future owner uh, of Twitter or Mark Zuckerberg or any of these other people with respect to opening the proverbial kabuki and letting us know what's going on with our accounts? I think that, uh, well, first, I think I'm pretty sure I'm off the blacklist. Uh, I, I, as best I can tell, I'm off the blacklist anyways. Um, and, and I've had reassurances from Twitter that, that I am, and I believe them. Um, I, I, and I have to say that uh, uh, on the, um, it just saddens me to see people who I think uh, broadly agree on what the, the nature of these pla the platforms ought to be um, sort of disputing with each other. Uh, you know, Elon Musk, Barry Weiss, I respect both of them greatly. Uh, uh, the, for the platform itself, I think um, Elon Musk promised something that he, he hasn't yet delivered, but really would would make, be ideal. If if there if if a if some content moderation policy is being applied to a user, I think that the that if the platform tells the user that it's happening, saying okay, here's why we're doing this, here's what we're doing, so that it's completely transparent. Okay, we've deboosted you here, we've done this. Um, and we, we put you on this, uh, this, the, you know, you, could, you did this strike or whatever, so that users know what the rules are. Th that just makes for a much better user experience, even apart from anything to do with government action. Uh, I don't think Twitter's there yet. Um, it's much better than Twitter 1.0. I mean, I was literally on a blacklist in Twitter 1.0, and I didn't, I didn't know it. Um, so it's just a very different, uh, di different kind of experience. I, di I don't think Twitter is perfect. Um, uh, I guess it's called X now. Is not is, is perfect, but I do think that is it is much better. Uh, I, I tell you, I've been on Facebook for a very long time. I basically I just share you know pictures of my family there because it's hopeless there to have any kind of meaningful conversation. I think because of the, the the moderation policies there. I think a lot of users will move to places where that kind of transparency happens, where open discussion can happen. They're not looking, I think, for you know uh, a, a kumbaya with everybody. What they're looking for is real. Uh, conversations about real important topics, even people with they disagree, and sometimes it can get heated. And co I think platforms ought to allow that. But I don't. But I don't. And but any legally prospective speech, I think, is, should be fine. And platforms should be very transparent with users about what they're doing. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you write about on your Substack? Sure. Uh, the Illusion of Consensus Substack is with a independent journalist, Rab Aurora, in um, I think he's located in Vancouver. Um, it's uh, it's a it's the goal is to talk with scientists who have been censored during the pandemic, who had alternate views during the pandemic about a whole host of topics, um, and and uh, and uh, more broadly about science in general. A lot of the problems I think we've seen in scientific discourse during the pandemic have come from this idea that there is this sort of central authority, you know, a high pope of science like Tony Fauci, who can tell everybody here's what's true, here's what's false. But that isn't how science actually works. Science at the edge is people looking, talking to each other in conversation, engaging with the data, disputing with each other. And it's by that process of engagement with data, engagement with other scientists that you actually move science forward. The Illusion of Consensus podcast, the goal is to lift the veil so that we you can show people uh, really what kind of conversation scientists actually have when they're that when th where you're discussing things that are not truly known and and to, to, to show the process by which uh, government authorities and some people within science itself try to create illusions of consensus in the context of COVID uh, when the consensus never actually existed. Mm. I, I wonder, just out of curiosity, I, I completely take your point, and I think we all saw the way that facts were flip-flopped on with respect to COVID reporting over the course of the last three years, whether it's the conflicting mask advice, um, overstatements about how effective the vaccine was going to be, et cetera. But it is also true that historically there have been broad consensus uh, building in, in science, and people have exploited the idea that there is not consensus 
to push forward different kinds of agenda agendas. I would say I would point to the cigarette industry and the well-documented um, cherry picking of studies often backed by the cigarette industry itself to continue to create ambiguity in the public as to whether or not cigarettes are really a public health concern. And so I do wonder, you know, what you see as kind of the line of how to discern when there are people trying to exploit the idea that there is a consensus versus people trying to exploit the idea that there is not, a fa in fact, a consensus when there, when there is. That's a great question. I, I do think, uh, and I agree with you, that there is an ethical responsibility that scientists have to reflect what the scientific data say, right? So, for instance, it is, uh, I think, in, incontrovertible at this point, as uh, in, in far as the evidence is concerned, that smoking causes lung cancer. Smoking causes all kinds of other diseases. So if a public health official or even a, 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 a uh, professor at a university, a medical school comes out and says, oh, smoking is good for you, they are lying to you. Um, I, I think the, the 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 way to address that is for public health authorities to, to uh, become so trustworthy that people will look to them when uh, when they when when these kinds of questions come up, right? I mean, for instance, if you if my colleagues in Sweden tell me that the public health authority in Sweden is very widely trusted because they've been very honest about when things are known and not known. Uh, so, you know, I think it is absolutely correct and appropriate to have a public health authority that has, has a, a, can say with authority that, look, smoking is terrible for you. It's really, really bad for you. You should stop doing it if, if you possibly can. Um, uh, and and it, when, when some Yahoo comes out and says, oh, smoking is good for you, well, people will, won't, won't believe them because they, they're, the public health authority is so trustworthy that, 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 they, uh, that they, they'll look to that for instead. Public health isn't like politics. If I convince only 50% of the public I failed as a public health figure. I, I mean, so I think the problem is that public health in the United States has thrown away its trustworthiness uh, by by embracing things that were not actually quite controversial, pretending as if they were uh, were consensus when they weren't. And, 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 and also by acting in ways that sort of, uh, uh, you know, for a lot of people uh, with, with political leanings that are different from a lot of people in public health, they're, you know, they, they look at public health and say, well, they don't represent me. That's a failure for public health. Public health needs to become a kind of, of uh, entity that everybody trusts, everybody looks to, and they do that by respecting everybody, by respecting scientific evidence, and being honest when the scientific evidence is uh, is is equivocal. Um, that's the problem during the, the 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 pandemic. I've never seen public health, the trust in public health, so low in my lifetime and my in my career, and it's and it pains me. And I think the problem is that public health itself brought on itself this distrust. The solution, Brianna, to this problem is that public health should become trustworthy. And I think that's the, that's the main tool we have in our toolkit to address those kinds of misinformation. Mm. Dr. Bhattacharya, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.